Hello, test, test. As usual, I always hate stopping this. Y'all are being so friendly and loving on one, and each, one another. I, I really struggle with that, but we got to go ahead and get on with the, with the service today, which is a good thing, too. Um, let me welcome you all to Christ Presbyterian. As again, whether you are an oldie moldy like me or you're brand new and anything in between, we appreciate you being here and those online as well. Um, with that, let me go ahead and get us going through our series of announcements. Um, let me give you a, the first one, Infant Nursery. It's open, it's available. If you need to, please take advantage of that, okay? Also, Children's Church. Now, we don't have it up, up yet. We're, Anna, how, are we, we're getting close to having the number of volunteers we need, right? We need about 20 people, and I'm going to have to do it. Okay. Okay, so, hey, we want a place to serve. Please, 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 that'd be great. Talk to Miss Anna. She'll, she'll be able to uh, hook you up on that one. All right. Let's see. Let me go with Miss Carrie. Women's Ministry. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to try a little something. You fill in the blanks for me. It's beginning to look a lot like Thanksgiving. <laughs> Not Thanksgiving. Okay. I'm dreaming of a. <laughs> okay. I hear you, rebels. I'm here to talk about our women's Christmas gift exchange. And I know Thanksgiving is next, but really, there is going to be a new sign-up sheet out on the bulletin board for the women's ministry. It's going to be Saturday, December 3rd, from 9.30 to 12.30, right here in the sanctuary at the church. This is an outreach event. So if you have a girlfriend who won't come to church with you, but would come to a Christmas gift exchange, this is a great opportunity for you to bring your friends that may be unchurched. Um, the gift exchange, there'll be more details to follow, but it's basically you bring six items that are identical. They can be handmade, they can be store-bought, but you need to bring six of the same thing, and then everyone who participates, you'll get to shop and take home six new items. Okay, so if you're crafty, be crafty, and if you're a sh store shopper, <laughs> go to the store and buy six cute things. They don't have to be expensive, um, but they should be something, you know, fun. Um, and the, the lady, the director of the, is it YPAC? Do I have that right? Yay -pac. Yay pac sorry, don't know how to say it. She is going to be sharing her testimony, and we will have a time of music and fun fellowship and festivities. So please... Make sure you sign up. We have to have numbers for this event because of just the logistics and organization. So please make sure you get your name on the sign-up sheet. The deadline for the sign-up, the cutoff, is um, Thanksgiving. So see how I brought that back to Thanksgiving? And you yeah. did it with alliteration, too. I love that. That's great. We love our alliteration here. All right, not to be outdone, Jonathan, come do the men part of this. Good morning. Uh, men, this upcoming Saturday is our men's prayer breakfast. So at 7.30 a.m., uh, ending at 9.30 a.m. sharp, um, we have our men's prayer breakfast. So again, first hour is breakfast. Second hour is a structured time of prayer. Uh, if you are interested in coming to that, there's a sign-up sheet out on the bulletin boards um, in front of the restrooms. If you could sign up uh, today after service or come find me after service so I know how much food to have available, I would appreciate it. Thank you. And finally, um, Mercy Ministry. Um, <laughs> I think Asa told me, I uh, told us yesterday, we're down to a mere $400 in the Mercy Ministry Fund. Now, the good news is we've been doing a whole lot of mercy, okay? Uh, Y'all, your, your, your contributions to that have made a huge difference in a lot of people's lives, and it's been used. But we're down to four. The, the other side of that, we're down to four hundred dollars. Now, how? What can we do about that? What can you do about it? We've we've for, forgotten to announce that on these first Sundays, Communion Sundays. Normally, you can do it at any time, but we do want, announce it usually on Communion Sunday, first first Sunday of the month. You need to, if you're going to 
fill out a check for that if you want to, or you're going to do it online, whatever you're going to do, you need to designate it specifically for Mercy Ministry, and it'll go directly to that fund, okay? And bless you for using for doing that. Uh, again, we've been using it a lot, a lot this last year, so thanks so much for that. So with that, let's make this transition. As I said, I, I call it for me recalibrating my heart to start getting my, he my head, my heart focused on the Lord, so.
It is a beautiful thing when player and instrument come together to God's praise. And if you will, as you're able, would you please stand? Let's use our voices to do the same. As usual, I'll be the leader. You are all very qualified to be the people. So let's follow along. Let's recite this back to the Lord. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. The Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. He has made them and the heights of the mountains. He is his for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Please bow with me. O Lord, from the highest heights to the deepest depths, you made it all. All is yours, including our very substance, both material and spiritual. You made it all. You own it all. We are yours, and we come to you praising you both for our making and our saving. For we are undone without you. Be pleased to receive our gratitude and praise this morning. Make our hearts fit vessels for praise and to receive that which you would give us. And let it all be to your glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Please remain standing and let's worship together. If Dave can claim prelude for himself, then I'm going to say that this morning's worship set is for me. So would you join me as we worship together? My heart needs it. I'm sure yours does too.
trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. So, friends, come today and stand beside this child of God. It is proper for the congregation of God's people to publicly confess our faith using creeds or confessions that are true to the word, such as the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or the Westminster Standards. Today we will recite the Nicene Creed. The four marks of the church are emphasized in this creed. We state that we believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. One, God's people are united in the truth. Holy, set apart for his service. Catholic or universal. Catholic means universal and emphasizes the biblical teaching that all who turn from their sin and trust in Christ alone for salvation constitute the church universal, people from every tribe and every tongue. Apostolic founded on the teaching of the apostles. Please stand and with this in mind, Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He went down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with the glory and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are the Almighty, the creator of all things, the Father who sent his only Son to die for our sins. We confess our sins and our utter need for a Savior. We confess the sins of pride and the very sins that brought your Son to the cross, the very sins upon his shoulders, the very sins that held him there until it was accomplished. We thank you for his wounds, his suffering, his very death, and his resurrection have brought life and salvation. Make us mindful of our utter dependence on you. Grant us faith. Grant us supernatural faith. Help us to truly believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Help us to love one another. Help us to show grace to one another. We pray for the Clarksville Presbyterian Church family. Thank you for these precious lives and their value, their worth, and their importance to this body, your church. As we continue the 2023 budget process, may our labors and the results and its implementation be glorifying to you. Help us as individuals, help us as a church 
to keep our conduct honorable and to glorify you in all our thoughts, words, and deeds. Be with Will this morning as he brings your word to us today. We pray that his message would be fruitful and glorifying to you. Love and protect the Cody family and the Schwartz family today and throughout the week. We pray that Christ Presbyterian Church would be a worshiping body of believers grounded in your word, increasingly gripped by your grace, growing in community and going in mission. Grant us a response of radical trust and obedience in worshiping you and not ourselves. God of grace, draw the unbelieving to you. May the light of your scripture illuminate all of life, including how we love our neighbor. As recipients of your great mercy, your great grace, help us to show that mercy, that grace, and that love to others in practical ways. Make us strong in family, marriages, and parenting, that we may be a godly church who loves one another and is committed to biblical peacemaking in response to conflict. By the work of prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, equip and send our members to faithfully serve in each one's mission field. We continue to pray for those affected by Hurricane Ian. We pray for those impacted as well as those responding. God, be merciful. Help us through your spirit to apply your word, your teaching to all aspects of our lives. May all our labors be done your way. All this we pray in the name of your son and our savior, Amen. Please stand as we once again worship together.
Our offering scripture today is taken from Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. And through these words, Jesus teaches us that our charitable giving is not just making a contribution, the kind of contribution that, you know, at the public's checkout, they say, would you like to add a dollar to the bill? You know, something that you don't really miss. But really, our charitable contributions are, is giving in such a way that we say, you know, I could have used that m myself for something else, but I want to give it away because I want to advance the kingdom of God. And that's what giving is. It's giving of ourselves. And so it hurts a little bit. Uh, there are a number of ways in which you can give to the church. You can use the boxes in the back. You can use the church's website, or you can use your own online banking. But however you do it, do it as an act of worship. shepherd I shall not want in green pastures he makes me lie down he restores my soul and leads me on for his name for his great
Good morning, CTC. My name is Will Cody, and I'm the campus minister at Austin P. State University for our denomination. And if you could turn to James chapter 5 in your Bibles, if you have the pew Bible, the blue one that's in the seat in front of you, it's on page 1013. Our text this morning comes from this guy named James. He was an early church leader, and he was writing to a uh, community of struggling believers. As you may know by now, because I was given this speech a lot, um, James presents his his uh, audience with these trials that every Christian is going to encounter in their life. And James wants his readers to persevere in these trials and to grow in joy, to grow in faith in the Lord Jesus, and to become more and more like him. Um, We're in chapter 5, so we've seen lots of trials so far in this book. Today we read what we could call, I think James would even call it this, the trial of hope. How is it that our hope in the future coming of Jesus, how should it influence us today? How should the future affect the present? Let's hear God speak to us, starting in verse 7 of our text here. This is God's word. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let's pray. Father, again, this morning, we need your help. There are things that we don't know, things that we have forgotten, or things that we just have stopped believing in or just forgotten. And we pray that you would make these things known to us so that we can trust in you, trust in your son, Jesus Christ, and be free. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was a student at UTK in Knoxville. And um, I took a semester off because I was having a hard time. And I worked at, on the Strip. It's called the Strip in Knoxville. And I worked at this place called Hamburger Henry's. I'm sure it's not there anymore. Um, I was the only cook there, and I worked there all the time. And my life was basically SpongeBob SquarePants for a whole spring semester. <laughs> um, flipping burgers. So uh, across the street from Hamburger Henry's was this club called Club Liquid. And it was what you would maybe imagine a dance a club next to a big university like that would look like, but somehow even trashier. <laughs> and there was one bouncer from that club that would come over in his downtime and just hang out with me in the kitchen, and his name was Conan. And if you don't know what a bouncer is, a bouncer is someone who, when people are dancing late at night, they, sometimes they get too excited. They drink too much uh, Mountain Dew, <laughs> too much caffeine, and... The bouncer's job is to bounce people out of there if they're causing fights or causing trouble. And Conan was the perfect guy for this job. He was huge. Um, he was in his mid-20s. And he was one of those people that he would come back and tell me these stories. You know, maybe in elementary or middle school, you had people like this that would tell these crazy stories, and you're like, there's no way that's true. Uh, he told me, for example, that he loved it when, for whatever reason, people tried to pick fights with him at Club Liquid. And I was like, that's kind of weird, Conan. Why? And he said that he had a secret weapon. So his strategy for dealing with people that wanted to fight with him was to get in as close as he can to this person and just bear hug them with their arms down, just bear hug them <laughs> like this. And what inevitably happened, w- especially if people had too much caffeine, was that their only move <laughs> at this point was if they wanted to continue fighting with Conan was to like headbutt him. Uh, but he had a secret weapon. He had a, a metal plate on, in his forehead, a steel plate. <laughs> so they would headbutt him and just <laughs> knock themselves out as he was hugging them. <laughs> And that's what he, Conan was into. Um, and he must have seen that I was a little skeptical, because I was like, really? And so he had me, you know, knock on his, and sure enough, it was not bone there. It was, it was definitely metal. And I felt bad for doubting him. One day he told me that on the day that he turned 30, he had some kind of trust fund or some kind of inheritance coming from his parents or somewhere, that the day that he turned 30, he was going to inherit $500,000. Now, $500,000 in 2002, with inflation, is probably like $10 million at this point, right? <laughs> In 2022. So he's just doing all these weird jobs. He's just waiting around, not worrying about the future, because he knew that he would have this inheritance coming. His hope 
was in this assured inheritance, and it affected the way that he lived in the present. He wasn't worried about the present. He wasn't worried about the future because his hope was in that inheritance. I, tried to, I, I believed him about that. I, mean, I, did, I was, uh, didn't trust him about that, and I was wrong, so I decided to just trust him on this, that this is true. <laughs> um, James has a similar message for his readers in our text today. This text that we just read is about hope. Um, biblically, though, hope is almost the opposite of how we use the word hope today. It's, it's obviously, it's not wrong to talk like this. I use it all the time. But today we use this word hope when we're talking about things that we strongly desire to happen, but the future is unsure. The, the future is this variable, un, uh, this variable up for grabs thing, but my desire for it is strong and unwavering. So I hope that I get a good grade on a test, right? And I hope that I get that job, or I hope that my, teams win, my team wins, or I hope that I can make it home on I-24 without <laughs> dying. <laughs> Especially this last couple weeks. The future is unsure, right? But my hope is strong and unwavering. The Bible kind of flips that around whenever the Bible talks about hope. Biblically, the hope that James talks about here is more like the hope that Conan had. The future is sure. The future is the independent variable here. It's the sure thing. It's going to happen whether I believe it or not. But the thing that's up for grabs, the thing that wavers, is my, is my, uh, my faith in it that is going to happen. That hope that we have, our Christian, our independent variable, the unwavering independent variable that James talks about in this text, isn't some future money, right? It's the return of the king. It's the return of Jesus. James' big idea in this text is that the Lord is coming. And there are many ways to respond to the fact that the Lord is coming. There are many ways, but James points out three here in our text. So because Jesus is coming, these are our three points. We should establish our hearts. We should forgive those who sin against us, not grumble against them. And we should endure suffering with patience. So look with me in verse 7. James writes, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So in the verses just before this, from the last time I was up here, James was talking to these rich oppressors. They were hoarding their wealth, they were oppressing the poor, and James was telling them that a day is coming for them that he's calling a day of slaughter, when everything that is wrong that, they're going, that they've done and that they're doing is going to be made right, and justice is going to come upon them in a day of slaughter. And he said this so that they would repent and trust Jesus and not riches. James makes a turn here, though, and now he's going to talk not at the oppressors, but at the oppressed. And he says, therefore, brothers, because the Lord is coming, they should repent and you should be patient. James here in the last chapter of this, uh, this letter that he's written is turning his listeners to the future. And he wants to live lives now in light of the future. There's one event in the future promised all over in the Bible, in, from the prophets, from the apostles, from the lips of Jesus himself, that there is going to, there's a day that we are all waiting for. And it's the next big event in history that we are all waiting for. This is the day that Jesus returns and restores this world to the way that it was all meant to be, and even better. Um, one writer summarizes it this way, is the day when everything that is sad will come untrue. The world right now is infected with death and disease and people sinning against us, this stuff coming from the outside, and inside of us. The problem is in here, too. Um, Paul puts it this way in Titus 3.3. 3. He's describing our own hearts as they naturally are, and Paul writes this, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. This may describe your high school. This may describe your workplace. This describes the world. And God saw the sad situation of these rebels, this world filled with rebels that hated him, that hated one another, that was spit in his face, and with death 
and judgment, that was their final end. And God said no to this. God said no to these rebels rebelling. And his response was to love the world, to love the world while it was in rebellion against him. And he sent his son while the world was bad, while the world was against him. And he sent his son. He sent his son, Jesus, to save us from all these sad realities. Inside of us, all the sad things inside of us, all the, um, the sin inside of us, and all, everything outside that's broken and diseased and dying. And he saved us from the future that was coming for us, too. And when he died on the cross, he takes all the punishment for all the eternal co- consequences of what, uh, for your sin. He takes your eternal punishment for your sin on the cross for all the things that you've said, all the things that you've done, all the things that you've thought, to destroy this holy God's good creation and creatures. And when Jesus Christ was resurrected three days later, it was proved not only that he had accomplished this mission of saving sinners, but also that this ultimate mission of restoring the universe, restoring the world, is that was his next mission. His resurrected body, so Jesus has this resurrected body that has defeated death. It's a perfect resurrected body. And it was seen by hundreds of witnesses, including James here. And this body is the first fruit of the resurrecting, the resurrected, uh, restored world that this world is all headed towards. Our body will be like Jesus's body, immortal, eternal, and good. And this world will be like Jesus's body, immortal, eternal, and good. So in Revelation chapter 21, the second to the last chapter of the Bible, um, John, the writer, puts it this way. He says, he... Jesus, at the end of time, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. So this will be the end of history. This is what we're all waiting for, and as something new begins. Now, what do you, how do you get, this sounds like a pretty good deal, right? How do you get into this program that God's got, going on? Is there a dragon that you need to slay? Is there some good deed that you need to do? Do you need to stop doing bad things and start doing good things first? Do you need to say a special prayer? No. All God requires of us is that we simply trust him, entrust ourselves to him. Trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins in his death, that he, and that he is going to restore all things, and just give yourself to him. James puts it this way earlier in his letter, in chapter 4. He says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Or as Pastor Richard put it from Mark chapter 1, Repent. Turn away from all these things that you're trusting in that are just destroying you and destroying the people around you. Give up trusting in money, in relationships, romantic relationships, uh, validation from, you know, romantic validation or um, from parents, and repent from trying to be a good person and just entrust yourself to this Jesus. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next year. We don't know what's going to happen by the end of the sermon. Something could happen. Hopefully not. But we do know this, that Jesus is coming. He will condemn evildoers. He will condemn evil and oppressors, and he will vindicate his people. He's going to make all things right and new. And for those who have trusted in Jesus, James has a word for us. Be patient, he says to us. Establish your hearts. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, what does it look like, knowing all that we just talked about, what does it look like to live in response to the future? Um, There are many ways to respond, but in this text, James, who is really concerned throughout this whole letter, he's really concerned with our speech, with our tongues. He tells us not to grumble against one another. That's one of the first ways in James for James that we respond to the future is by not grumbling. Um, this is our second point that we are to forgive those that sin against us and not grumble against them. Um, he writes in verse nine: "Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, this judge he's standing at the door." So what James is saying here, follow me for a second. It's kind of interesting. He's saying to the degree that our hope is in the return of Jesus. We will not grumble about other people. We will cease from things like judging people, complaining, um, gossiping, cursing them, cursing them to other people. 
and speaking evil about other people. Um, James, is, uh, James steals so much from the Sermon on the Mount. It's uh, crazy. He's a plagiarizer. But he's taking this from, uh, from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, where Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. James and, and Jesus, are all, they're all saying that it would be absurd for us to go around judging and complaining against other people because we have been so radically um, absolutely forgiven by God. It doesn't make any sense. How can we hold grudges against other people when God decided he was going to fix the problem between me and him so he wouldn't have a grudge against me? How can I be holding grudges against other people? Also, if we continue grumbling, if we decide that we're going to plant my flag here, I'm going to be a grumble, grumbler or a uh, complainer or a gossiper or a slanderer about another people. I plant my flag and I say, I'm not going to do that. Wh what does that show about our hearts? Have your hearts actually met Jesus? Has that really actually, has he really actually been forgiven? If not, then there is judgment for us coming. The judge is standing at the door. He's hearing all the things we're saying about these people that he lived and died for. But how easy is it still, I mean, I'm still, this hits me, how easy is it for us in the pressures of life, in the pains of life, in the anxieties of life, to, when we're hurt, blame and grumble and judge other people, especially when you feel hurt, especially when they hurt you. James says that when we suffer because of others, knowing that Jesus is coming is your comfort, that when he comes, he is going to make everything right, so we can just obey him and trust him, knowing that he is going to make everything all right. Let me give you a practical example from my own life about what this <laughs> looks like and continues to look like. When I was in college, you know, having a hard time, um, I was very poor. I got a really good deal on this electric guitar, and I loved playing it, and I was um, keeping it at one of my musician friend's houses. And in this hard time of my, of my life, like playing guitar, learning to play electric guitar was a source of uh, joy for me, a small little place of joy for me. And one day, my guitar disappeared. And I was so frustrated and discouraged and sad because I wanted to learn uh, to play electric guitar well. I wanted to shred on the guitar. And it was just a, a little place of joy for me at that time in my life. Um, years later, after I moved away from Knoxville, and um, I found out who had, th I found out that someone had stolen my guitar, and I knew who it was. And he had moved, he'd moved to another place, and our paths are not crossing at the moment. We're in different places. Um, and this guy at the time, he had lots of guitars. <laughs> and not only did he have lots of guitars, he came from a very well-off family. And I was so angry. Like, why would he take this thing, this little thing that I love? And I still deal with that anger when I think about this guy. <laughs> um, and if I did not believe in the coming of Jesus, I would be wanting revenge. And I still do sometimes. If I did not believe in the coming of Jesus, I would be telling everyone who this person is. Um, if you ask me personally about this guy, I'm just going to shut my mouth and not talk because I know what's going to come out. <laughs> um, when I feel this way, my heart is not established. I am not being patient like James is telling us to be here. I want everyone to know his name. I, I want everyone to know that he's a terrible friend. I want everyone to know that this guy's a thief. And th what this is, is I want justice now. I want to take, God's not doing anything about it, and I want to take matters into my own hands. And it would feel so good. You know the feeling when you imagine um, revenge n on somebody else, when you, um, that feeling you get when you destroy someone else's reputation by grumbling about them to others. Or when we're giving someone, we know exactly the words that's going to destroy you, and I'm going to give you these words and watch you be destroyed. That good feeling that we're feeling? <laughs> um, I know that I am forgiven by Jesus, right? Or we mentioned before. And therefore, I should forgive others. But this is not enough for me sometimes, especially when someone destroys something beautiful in your life. But this is what comforts me. This is what keeps me from sinning against that guy and against God, is that Jesus is going to return, and in that day, <laughs> I c if I want to learn how to shred an electric guitar, I totally can. <laughs> but on top of this, and that's a, re that's a real comfort to me, on top of this, um, this guy is going to come up to me, and this guy, he's a Christian, this guy is going to come up to me, and he is going to restore that relationship with me. Or maybe I'll go and find him first and initiate on that day. Or somehow if our paths cross before that, I can do that before then. Or maybe he'll come to me before then. 
But I know that at the end of the day, God is going to make all things right when Jesus returns. On the day that Jesus returns, everything that's wrong, everything that's up in the air, all the, your broken relationships, all the still open wounds that are never going to be closed until you die or Jesus returns, all, even the one, my still, still open wounds, and the ones that I've caused to other people, they are all going to be healed by the great physician, the king. And everything will be healed and good forever. <laughs> this is the trial of hope. To the degree that my hope is in the return of Jesus, I can forgive that guy, for example. I don't have to be impatient and enact justice now. Jesus is going to take care of it. I can trust Jesus and be comforted and do what Jesus wants me to do, which is forgive, un uh, forgive unlovable people and to love unlovable people. But notice, this, this is very comforting, right? It is very comforting that God is going to make all things right when Jesus returns. But this isn't just about being comforted. This is about being comforted so that you can obey God, so that you can obey your King Jesus. He comforts us with the promise of his return so that we will obey him, so that we will love unlovable people. Um, I told you one of my people in my life, I wonder if you have one in your life. Is there someone in your life that has hurt you or made your life hard or has taken something beautiful from you and there's no fixing it as far as you can see on this side of Jesus returning? There's no fixing it. There's no resolve except when Jesus returns. Is there any person in your life where the return of Jesus is the only answer, the only way that you can be comforted and obey and forgive this person? Imagine. I have to do this a lot with this guy. Imagine what it will be like when Jesus returns and begin forgiving them today. Remember, and remember that forgiveness is an ongoing thing. It's not a one and done. It's something that comes back over and over again that you have to apply this gospel to yourself, that Jesus is returning. James, though, he wants us to apply what I just talked about with, what James talked about with people, to everything, everything, all, all the places that we suffer in our life. Because Jesus is coming, this is our third point, we can endure all suffering with patience. Let's look at verses 10 through 11. James writes, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So James gives two examples here of um, what it looks like to have your heart established and to endure suffering with patience. First, he gives the examples of the Old Testament prophets. Now, they had a terrible job. <laughs> God tasked these people with pointing out where Israel was sinning, where it was straying, where it was, uh, Israel were oppressing the poor and being unfaithful to their covenant God. God put his words in their mouths, and they denounced this injustice uh, false worship, and they were met with hostility, almost 100% met with hostility. Like, the people just ignored them. The leaders actually attacked them. Sev many of them were killed by the le leaders, and they never saw, in their lifetimes, while they were alive, they never saw the fruit of their trust and their obedience while they were alive. A lot of them, the last thing they saw was somebody murdering them. <laughs> then he takes up the story of Job, and if you don't know the story of Job, there's a whole book in the, in the Old Testament called Job, which is about Job. And terrible things happen to this guy, Job. And most of the book is him lodging complaints to God, who is letting these things happen. There's a lot to learn from the book of Job. One is that it's good to complain against God. It's good to complain to him. It's good to be angry with him. You can express your anger to God. He can handle your anger. I promise. He can handle it. And it, you can actually draw close to him in your anger. Uh, but Jummy pointed this thing out one time. Jummy, my wife, pointed out to me, this to me, that we, the readers, when you read the book of Job, you, we know what's going on. We know what's going on in the background between, you know, God and Satan and all this stuff. But Job never does. The whole time that he's suffering, until he, until he dies, he never knows all the background to why this is happening. He never knows. He just suffers. His whole experience is in the book is trying to understand and make sense of these evil things that are happening in this good God. And what binds these two examples together is that whether that suffering came from the hands of other people, like it did with 
the prophet, or whether this suffering came from the hands, it seems like, from God, these people suffered, and they were patient, and they endured, and they were steadfast. They were actually, these, both of these guys, they were singled out for being righteous. This is why they suffered, actually. And when they experienced this suffering, in response to it, they entrusted themselves to this compassionate and merciful God who they knew that he was, even when it seemed like the suffering was even caused by him. Even when it seemed like no good could come out of this as I'm being murdered <laughs> for, doing righteous, for doing righteousness. They, Job and these, and these uh, prophets, they entrusted themselves to him despite what they were experiencing. And in the end, they had a choice. They could deem God trustworthy or they could deem him a demon. <laughs> and they, cho they chose to trust God, that he is good. They knew that God's good purposes would somehow prevail, even if they wouldn't see it in their lifetime. They continue to trust and obey him. James wants his readers, like Job, like the prophets, to establish your heart now for when suffering is happening to you now and in the future. That when suffering comes, whatever that looks like, you will not be like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. But the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is your anchor for your soul. Now, uh, we know in the death and in the resurrection and in the second coming of Jesus that Jesus is trustworthy. Continue to entrust yourselves to him. Um, unlike Conan from earlier in this story, I forget about this sure hope that I have. In my mind, I often live as if there is no future hope, as if Jesus is never coming, or if, if, as if God has abandoned me, and I'm all by myself, and I forget. And that, every time that happens, that's the, that's the root of all sin. That's the root of all rebellion, is that God's not going to take care of me. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to take matters into my own hands. And because we forget, God gives us this meal that we regularly eat together, the Lord's Supper that we're eating today. And what is it that Jesus says? Why do we do this meal? He says, do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance that I have died for you. That I was raised for you. That I am coming back for you to make everything right. The Lord's Supper is this mini foretaste of the coming of the Lord. In this, in this meal, the risen Lord Jesus, who his body is in heaven right now. He comes and he is with us and he communes with us by his Holy Spirit. This is the future breaking in to the present to remind us and to encourage us, to renew us. He does this to strengthen us in, his, in our trust in him. And he does this, he comforts us this way so that we would obey him, so that we would do his will. You'll we will trust him. You will trust him more as you take this meal and commune with the Lord Jesus. Paul writes about this meal in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. This meal that we're about to partake in is a meal for those that have entrusted themselves to Jesus. They've, these are people that have become a member of this church or any church where the second coming of Jesus is proclaimed. It's, it's for people that have been baptized in his name and desire to grow in their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a family meal for those who are trusting in the, the return of Jesus. But if you're here and you're just curious, or you got dragged here or something, welcome, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, I or any of the other leaders here would love to talk to you. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, or if you're a Christian here and you've planted your flag that I'm going to sin, I'm not going to trust God. I'm not going to do what God says. I'm not going to do it. This meal is also not for you. We would ask, please, talk to one of the elders. <coughs> if I've just described you. But if you've come to church today, and if you've had a terrible week of failing, struggling with sin, failing some more, struggling with sin, and failing, 
I would especially encourage you to come to the table and be strengthened by Jesus. Come experience his compassion and his mercy. Uh, if I could ask the elders if they would come forward and musicians want to come up too. Um, we have the bread and the cups in these tables, on these tables. Um, the bread is gluten-free, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to come forward row by row, and you can eat the bread, um, and then we'll all take of the cup together. And we'll make sure that everybody gets served. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your table with you, we pray that you would encourage us that you're coming back and that this encouragement and this comfort would, would, um, would sink deep into our hearts so that we can live lives that are solid, not tossed by the winds of suffering and circumstances, but our anchor of our soul would be in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Christian, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take together.
Let's respond by singing to him. Hear God's good word to you from the book of Revelation, the last two verses in the whole book. He says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. And God's people say, Amen. 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 Amen.